if there is a deeper aspect to reality beyond just the physical and there is a spiritual part of all living creatures, then why is the human condition filled with pain, suffering, old age and death? You see, the idea of suffering is the real thing that is, is raising. A lot of people say, Mr. Lakhani, if the underpinning to his reality is spirit, pure and pristine and perfect and really you know, graceful, how come the world we see is so cantorous, so crude, so jagged, so cruel? And this is a minor thing. This cruelty is visible all around us. This is how Buddhism started, just focusing on the issue of suffering. There's no suffering in the human kingdom. You're waiting for GCS or whatever. The suffering is in the living kingdom. And people don't realize this. If you look at the living kingdom, the amount of suffering you see is far, far higher. And not just one or two individuals. Trillions of livings are living each of each other, eating while they're alive. Trillions of livings are eating and munching and punching each other while they're fully alive. Just imagine the cruelty. And the other thing I must raise is this. People somehow feel, well, it's all right. That's, you know, they're like things. They're not really human. They don't feel. In fact, in reality, just think about it. Animals live at the level of senses. It's their senses are accentuated. That's why the dog can smell better. They have fully, fully going to focus on these five senses. They're far more developed than us. If they're living at the, at the level of the senses, if you cut a cow or any, any animal, just cut it, the amount of pain that animal will feel will be far higher than us. Because we humans are not that kind of in, attuned to the senses. They are living on the senses. So if you give them any physical pain, the amount of, I'm just guessing, I hope I don't have to go through that, the amount of suffering they'll feel, with, I would say 10 times more than we human beings can feel. So you see this tremendous suffering all around. So the question is very pointed, saying, if the underpinning is spirit, pure and pristine and, 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 and gracious, how come the world we see is full of nothing but suffering? And this is exactly what drove Buddha to leave his kingdom, not to sort out his own suffering. He had no suffering. He was living like a prince. He walked out saying, I'm looking for and resolution to the suffering of the whole of the living kingdom. That's the basis of Buddhism. That's why people love Buddha. He was not out for his personal, you know, uh, 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 no, enlightenment. He was looking for resolution of the, of the suffering he sees all around us. And this is really the real situation. Now, the Hindu, philosophic Hindu response, I'll give you two responses. One is kind of more narrative based, which I don't like. It's a cop out. And the other is more philosophic, which is not a cop out, but is some kind of response. The narrative-based Hinduism, suppose you believe in say, Vishnu or Shiva or Mother Goddess as the creator, woohoo, yoohoo, wonderful. And the question arises, why suffering? The answer they will give will be the same as the Abrahamic religions. Christianity, Judaism, Islam will give the same answer. They'll say it's God's wish, we don't know why. This is how God is. This is God's wish. We don't know how he operates. So they will just get a cop out. They're saying it's not, not our issue. It's God's play. The Hindus, the, the people who believe in narrative Hinduism, is people, for, you know, grand personalities, will give the same answer. They'll say, this is called, the Sanskrit term is Leela. Leela means the play of God. This suffering that you see, people crying, screaming, eating, being eaten up. God's play? What kind of play is that? It's a vicious God. So again, this is if like a cop-out. The Abrahamic tradition use it. Say, God's, this is God's wish, we don't know what his plans are. Or the Hindu saying it's God's way of playing. Playing what playing? It's a horrendous play. The philosophic response to the very serious challenge of why suffering, what is the, why, how come something very pure and pristine produce this very cantorous universe? The philosophic idea is quite different. I'll touch on it. Philosophical response that says, underpinning the spirit, the Bhutam is Brahman, Brahma. When it manifests or makes appearance this creation, it pays a price, it pays a tax. So it is, if you like, the, the, if you like, because this pristine thing wants to take on a form or manifest, it has to pay a heavy price. And the price comes in three forms. Physical suffering, mental suffering, and spiritual suffering. I just touch on them. How does physical suffering arise? You may think, well, it's you know, horrible. What's, how, how does it arise? Just think about it. I'm giving you a very clear way of thinking about physical suffering. Every time you get physical suffering, suppose you're at the moment feeling hungry, you're paying of hunger, I didn't eat this morning and I didn't have lunch, I'm hungry, I'm painful, it's painful. What's happening? Basically, your defense system of your body is kicking in, saying, idiot, eat, otherwise you'll die. And the only way it can tell you you're an idiot, you must die, eat immediately, is to make it very, very painful. Oh, so if it's pain, pleasurable, suppose you're hungry, you're oh, so nice, you'll not eat and you'll die. It has to be a sting, you know, this will to sting you. So the physical suffering, just analyze all the suffering, physical suffering, whether it's to do, suppose you put your finger in the fire, ah, 
the body is saying, you want to burn your finger, pull it out. And it can't say in a gentle way, hello, pull your finger out. It will say, pull it out, it will be sharp, you must go out. So suffering comes because if you like it, a prize is a self-defense mechanism kicking in, saying you want to continue to live in the body, get, get, get some food in your tummy. See, the physical suffering we get is if you like nothing but your self-defense mechanism. So, so why did this horrible self-defense mechanism come into play? Because this thing that was trying to manifest wants to become a human and want to continue to survive, so it is ready to pay a price, a tax for having a body. And this is why the physical suffering arises. Analyze any physical suffering. It's just your ploy to continue to survive. And that makes the, the, the interaction you have is very painful. Otherwise, if it's, if it's pleasurable, you just get you and put your finger and burn your hand, whole hand. It has, to, it has to be very sharp. This is physical suffering. Animals don't have it. So that is the one part of suffering. The second part of suffering is called mental suffering. <laughs> now the mental suffering begins because you see, we hold aspirations. You want to go to the Oxford University. If this person gives you a bad record, you can't go there. Oh dear, oh dear. So the mental suffering comes because your wishes are not fulfilled. Your ambitions are not being fulfilled. Your desires are not being fulfilled. They're being frustrated. Think about all the mental, men, mental suffering you face. It's standard. It's so easy, easy to analyze. The desires you have are being frustrated or, or are being obscured or whatever. So that is the source of all your mental, me, mental distress. You got wound up. I must do this. I must get these high marks and do this. And that getting frustrated and that makes you feel very upset and, you know, mental, men, mental suffering begins. It's throughout your life, not only at, at, at eight in college. Even when you get married, lots of desires will arise. Oh, I want my daughter to go to this school or whatever. And that doesn't happen. You go, ah, you go. See, it's continuous. It continues throughout your life. It's like an infection we all have. Desires, unfulfilled and frustrated desires cause stress, mental problems. That is why the NHS in UK is paying a heavy price. Because the, the life, you know, life, the lifestyle has been so, you know, kind of tightened. Everybody is to fulfill certain projects, certain, you know, uh, ambitions. Otherwise, they feel they're left out. And it's get more and more wound up. They get more and more wound up. That's why you see so much frustration and frenzied lifestyle. Fulfill desires. And it's not possible. They get frustrated. They get whacked and create tension. That's why NHS, the biggest problem in NHS, biggest disease the NHS are treating is not cancer. Hopefully not going to be this coronavirus. It is, if you like, the mental stress that you encounter. And the reason is the society is in a way winding up, it winding you up to have more and more desires, which remain unfulfilled. And you keep paying a heavy price. It's stress-related illnesses that are the biggest problem in NHS. So again, this is a source of mental desires. Eh? It's really mental suffering. Your desires have been stopped up and they can't be fulfilled, so you pay a price. So you say, but Ms. Lakani, how do desires arise? If I can stop these desires, I'm off the, off, the, off, the, off the problem. I don't have mental, mental suffering anymore. How do I switch off the desires? Think about it. It's not easy. That's what Buddha is. This whole of Buddhism I'm giving you in a nutshell. Desires are like an infection. And we all suffer from it. All living things suffer from it. Not only human, all living things suffer from it. So what is the reason for it? Why are they so chasing out of this? And once they chase after one thing and it doesn't seem to produce results, they chase after another thing. And it goes on forever. Why? Where does it start? This is the, if you like, the depth of our Hindu teaching and of Buddhism. It says basically, you are trying to fill a hole in your system, that's why desires arise. So I was fulfilled, I didn't have any desires to drop off. But I always feel something missing, nothing. That's why you try and fill up that hole by chasing after material objectives. That's what we all do. If I get that, if I can go on holiday and do this, then I'll feel, I'll feel fulfilled. It doesn't do that, but you try it. All your life you keep doing chasing after shadows. So the source of mental desires are unfulfilled desires. And the source of desires is where the heart of our religion is. The reason is this, this is what we teach. We say the reason why desires don't stop, even though you chase after all the shadows throughout your life. Look, I'll give you my example, okay? I always felt if I go on a cruise, I'll be fulfilled, I'll be so happy, oh, sun and sand and sea, and I love all that. I'll be so happy. I mean, you know, kind of euphoric state, you know, in heaven. So I went on a cruise. You can do that as well, you'll, you'll soon find out. And I went to the, the Bahamas and we're sitting on the, you know, the beach and lovely and, you know, something, a cocktail in hand, everything. And I said, oh, in five seconds, the fish disappeared. I just said, oh, wow, then finished. It's like a, you get a straw, dry straw, and you burn it, it goes, finished. 
So the love that I had, I was so happy, 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 it just disappeared. And I'm back normal. Now, what else do I do now? What else do I chase after tomorrow? It didn't have any, any substance to it. And again, the best example I use here at Eton is this. Look, here around, the, around, the, around Eton, you've got Windsor Castle. And then you've got the Queen. And I think she's got everything in her favor. Material wealth, uh, position in society, respect in society. Everybody calls her ma'am and bows down to her. And little Corgi is, you know, snapping at her heel. She's got everything in the butlers, serving tea and everything. She's got everything. She must go, yahoo, yahoo, day and night. Just look at her face. <laughs> I'm going to get kicked out of Eton, I think. But look at her face. It looks so tired and miserable. Oh, no, not now. Not Prince Harry again. Oh, no. There's no end to it. So what's happened to her? All these lovely things she had seems to have got, phew, disappeared. And she's got, I hope Harry be yours. So her now desires to make sure Harry you know, stays in line. So there's no end to this. So the fact that you have a lot of power, position, money, doesn't seem to sort you out. Why or oh, why? I'm going to go and give a lecture to the Queen. <laughs> the reason is this. There's something missing in your system and you're trying to fill that gap. And you're chasing out of the wrong, wrong way to fill that gap. You're putting the wrong stuff in it. It doesn't work. It just shadowy. It doesn't produce any result. This is what we are teaching. We say, the real thing that is stirring you, making you full of desires, is that you are, the thing that is missing <coughs> in you, is not that cuff. The thing that's missing in you is, you don't know your true nature. You are in search of your true nature. And you think by chasing out material things, I've got more position, power, money, I've sorted myself out. No, my friend. The thing that is stirring up desires in all of us is because you are in search of your true nature. Not as a material being, but it's a spiritual being. So your search is being always spiritual. And you don't know, it happens unconsciously. That's why you keep chasing other things. You're trying to fill that hole by filling it with wrong stuff. Either physical material or mat mental, you know, I love music. Okay, just give you a little freeze and it disappears. The real thing that you are searching for, you'll stop desires forever, for good, is to recognize your true nature, not as a material being, but as a spiritual being, a spirit. You are a spirit. When I say spirit, you know, sometimes a little kind of little spark going by. That's your true nature, magnanimous true nature, the underprince reality. That is your nature. You're going to try to get back to it. That keeps produces a lot of desires. That's the source of desires. And this is a very beautiful thing to explore. Now, I tell you, you may say, Mr. Lakhan, you're talking, but it's kind of, you know, airy fairy, come on. When you look at some of the modern giants, of, in, uh, spiritual giants of India, and look at their lives, you know what I mean. I'll give you one example, you chase it out, check, check it out on Google, Ramana Maharshi. Just used to wear one piece of white cloth, just to, doesn't appear naked. No other possessions, no other movement, no sectarian movement, nothing. And yet full of kind of sparkling, shining, with tremendous kind of, no desires for anything. And you say, what, what a man. Because we live, if you like, slaves of the universe that we inhabit. We must chase after this desire, so we become slavish. Here is a man who lived like a master, not like a slave of the world he lived in. This is what happens when you find out your true nature. Because all these other chasing appear so pointless, they drop off. You don't have to fight the desires, they just drop off. Because you are establishing your true nature, which is pure and pristine. You don't need anything. So you still live, you don't give up your body. And you still live like a master rather than a slave. Just think about it. We live like, slave, live like slaves. Look, some of the beautiful girl passes by. But they were like, you know, we all uh, glance at her. Can't help it. You are like uh, slaves. But you know, no, it's getting ticklish. What ticklish? You are being turned into a slave. This is the attitude which takes, takes us, stops us, if you like, from mental stresses, mental desires. This is the resolution. So I've taken a long time. I think it's a very interesting question to take up. <laughs>